Church, if you would turn to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cody Page, the senior pastor here at Gray Gables. Uh, I love this church. I'm so thankful for the gift that God has given uh, my family and you. And uh, I praise the Lord for you every day. And I pray for you every day. And I'm thankful for our time together. We're going to continue in the Gospel of John. Um, and we're not going to take any more breaks for, for a while, okay? So we're going to be in the Gospel of John for a couple months. I'll quit uh, diverting and kind of walk through this uh, for the foreseeable future, at least until August, more than likely, we'll be in John. And so I want to encourage you to continue to study God's Word, to continue with the uh, Scripture memory verses that we're doing each week. These are all purposeful to help surround you and saturate you with the Word of God, which is what we want to be about as First Baptist Church of Grey Gable. So if you found your place in John chapter 5, would you stand for the honor of reading God's Word together with me? The Word of God says these things. It says, After these things, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porticos. In these lay a multitude of those who were sick, blind, lame, and withered waiting for the moving of the waters. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred up the water. Whoever then first, after the stirring up of the water, stepped in was made well for whatever disease with which they were afflicted. He was afflicted. A man was there who had been ill for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew he had already been a long time in that condition, he said to him, Do you wish to get well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. Immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, My father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. First Baptist Church of Greg Gables, are you thankful for the word of God this morning? Amen. Let's join together and thank him for it, shall we? Lord, we do thank you for the word. We thank you that it is the lamp unto our feet and the light unto our path. We thank you that by it, Father, you train us to righteousness. Lord, that in it you have given us, Lord, the ability to pierce hearts, to speak truth, to stand boldly under the assurance and the authority of the Word of God. We ask that we would do that this morning, Lord, that we would allow your Word to speak directly to us, that it would shape us and mold us into the image of Christ, and we would be sanctified this morning from it. Lord, I also pray that if there is anyone here this morning who does not know you, that they'd simply ponder the question, do I wish to get well? And Father, you would reveal to them exactly what you've done on their behalf to get well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This morning, we're coming to another marvelous account in which we are going to see the wonderful compassion and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in his healing ministry. Yet, at the same time, we are going to see the sad reality of the people despising our Savior for that healing he had done on this particular day, specifically the Pharisees. In verse 1, as you notice, sometime after he had healed the royal official son, Jesus went back up into Jerusalem in order to attend the feast 
of the Jews. Now, we know that there were three at least different feasts. We don't know which of those three annual feasts this was because John doesn't tell us that. He doesn't tell us to find it important enough to give us that information. Now, some might want to know why it was so important for Jesus to attend these feasts. Why is that so important for him that he would redirect his steps and go back up into Jerusalem each time this feast rolls around? Well, he did that because it was something that was required in God's law. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, God says this, Three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the feast of the unleavened bread, and the feast of the weeks, and at the feast of booths. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. So we know that whenever Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast, he did so in obedience to God's law. Because he obeyed every aspect of God's law perfectly, and he did so on our behalf. Not only to show that he was qualified to be the perfect and final sacrifice, but also through his act of obedience, he would be able to impute his righteousness to those who belong to him. And as a result of this perfect work of Jesus Christ, if you are in him, then you have his righteousness credited to your account so that when God looks at you he sees somebody who has perfectly obeyed every jot and tittle of God's holy law from beginning to end that's amazing considering how many times I've broken God's law and know that in my own life that because of the righteousness of Christ because of his perfect obedience to the law that when God looks at me He sees perfect righteousness because of the covering of the sun. What a gift. In verses 2 through 4, we are told of this pool next to a sheep gate. And this pool is called Bethesda, which in Hebrew can be translated literally the house of mercy. Now, apparently it was believed that this pool had special healing powers. That an angel used to go down at a certain time to stir up the waters, and when the waters began to be troubled, the first person that entered the water was healed of their disease. Now, it's really hard and difficult to say with certainty that, that what was believed about this pool was actually happening, or whether or not it was just the popular opinion of that day, and John's just giving us that. You'll find good commentators going in both directions on this issue. Some believe that this was a true account of something that happened in this particular point in time. Others are of the opinion that what John was sharing with us was just the popular opinion of the day that was based upon superstition. However, these things don't seem to make much of a difference as it relates to John's purpose in including this miracle in his gospel. Regardless of what we believe about this angel and the power of these healing waters, The point that John wants to impress upon us here is quite clear. John wants us to see and appreciate the utter hopelessness and helplessness of this man's situation. What a pitiful situation he was in. And what a wonderful reason for Jesus to show up at this pool. A place where so many sick, needy, and helpless people congregated from day to day just hoping that they would be the next one to win the lottery and be healed. This was a wonderful place for the great physician to make a house call. In the following verses, in verses 5 to 6a, we we learn that this particular man was in this miserable state for 38 years. Now, one can wonder and speculate how many of those years were spent by the side of that pool hoping against hope that he just might be the next one in. And we're also told that Jesus knew he had been in that condition for a long time. Jesus knew how desperate this man was. And for some reason, Jesus focuses his attention on this particular man. Now, this is something we aren't told why. We weren't told why Jesus went to this pool initially, but as we read, we discover exactly why he went there. He went there to show us a glimpse of his glory as a son of God. 
he went there to display his glory through the healing of this sick and hopeless man. Think about this for just a moment. We are told in the scriptures that there were many sick people by the pool there that day. We don't know how many, but we are told that there are a great multitude of people. Here's one of the most amazing things about this account. In his omnipotent power, Jesus easily could have healed every single person in that place. It wouldn't have troubled him in the least to do that. But we learned that that he singled out this one particular man. Without a doubt, this emphasizes the fact that God has mercy on whom he will have mercy. That Jesus picked this man out of a crowd of equally hopeless and helpless people. Not one of them was deserving of his incredible mercy, but he just chose to heal this one man out of the multitude. This man didn't make himself do anything to make himself noticeable to Jesus. He didn't cry out to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. He didn't do anything like that. Jesus is the one who initiated things with this man. It was all Jesus. Our God is a merciful God full of compassion. And friends, if you are in Christ this morning, you should be sure to call it a great blessing that Jesus Christ has set his eyes upon you and that he was pleased to initiate a relationship with you. What an incomprehensible gift it is that God has chosen to be merciful to each one of us who belongs to him. We should not be able to help but to break out with the praise of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter eleven thirty three, 33, who says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. What a glorious God we belong to. See, the same Jesus who took notice of that one needy man in the midst of all those other needy people has also taken notice of you if you were in him. You may think that you are unnoticeable. You may think that nobody sees or cares about your current condition. I can tell you that the same man, same Jesus that saw this man and knew this man's condition is the same Jesus who is here in our midst this morning. And I can tell you this, He is far more ready to heal you than you are ready to be saved. He is far more ready to do good to you than you are willing to receive it. Let's move on to verse 6b and and consider this question that Jesus proposed to this man. A very important question in my opinion. Jesus said to him simply, Do you wish to get well? Now, in some ways we might think that this is a strange question to ask, right? It seems like a rhetorical question. At the many times I've been to the hospital and visited you all when you were sick, right? You didn't hear me ask, well, do you want to get better? (laughs) Do you want to get out of this place? No, I just always assumed that would be the case. It seems like a rhetorical question. After all, who in their right mind, after being in this condition for 38 years wouldn't want to be made well. Why the question? Well, there are a few things for us to glean from this question. First of all, I think Jesus, in asking this question, was bringing the reality of this man's condition front and center. With the question, Jesus was basically reminding the man of his bad situation and great need. You see, friends, if you go up to a person and say to them, you ever wish you were smart? (laughs) Something's implied in that question, right? If you went up to a person and said, don't you wish you were good looking? (laughs) Don't do that. I don't advise that, right? Because people can see right through the heart of that question, can't they? They know what is being implied when you ask a question like that. With Jesus' question, he is bringing this man to a point where he is going to have to acknowledge his need. This man needed to openly acknowledge that he was in need of the healing that only Jesus could give to him. To readily admit that he was a sick man in poor condition and in a helpless condition. You see, 
before we can really appreciate what it is that Jesus offers us, we must recognize that we have a need. Without understanding the fact that we are hopeless sinners who have broken God's law and we're under his condemnation, we will never fully appreciate the actual good news of the gospel. And another reason Jesus asked this man whether he wished to get well is because, believe it or not, some people really don't want to get well. Some people, I believe, have come to actually like their poor conditions. Why? Well, some folks may like the pity that it draws. In fact, I believe some people live by that pity. Some people like to be able to justify the bitterness in their lives. Some people don't want to be made well because they don't want the responsibilities that come with getting well. There are some in this world who would count it a curse to get well. Many of them think they have a good thing going in their pitiful conditions. Now, we don't know for sure, but given that this pool was near the temple, this man may very well have made a good living receiving alms from the worshipers. So when Jesus had asked this man if he wished to get well, he may have also wanted him to consider the ramifications of getting well. You're no longer going to get a handout. Do you wish to get well? Do you know what this means? Friends, this healing mercy of Jesus is something that he continues to offer to us today. Even after we are in Christ and have come to him in salvation, Jesus still offers his healing to us. We are in need of many healings. We all still wrestle with sin and troubles in this life, even after coming to Christ. So this morning, Jesus is asking this question that he asks to this man, to each one of us. Do you wish to get well? Maybe some of us have been bitter against somebody for a long time or bitter over the things, the way things are going in our lives. Jesus' question is before us. Do you wish to get well? Or do you like having a reason to remain bitter? Do you like your condition more than you like the idea of letting go and being healed by Christ? Some of us might be in bondage to particular sins in our lives, certain sins we have come to love more than God. Do you wish to get well this morning? Or do you like being sick? Do you like being less than what your Lord would like you to be? Has your sin been such a long-standing part of your life that you simply accept it as a lifelong disease that you are settled with taking to the grave? You may think that it's too late to be healed. You may think that sin has dug too deep of roots to leave you with any hope of being healed. But friends, there is no such thing in Christ. Whether you have long-standing sins in your life or if you've adopted new sins recently, Jesus' question is the same to you this morning. Do you wish to get well? Carefully consider that question. Think about what is entailed in your answer. If you say, yes, Lord, I want to be made well, are you prepared for what will be required of you and what will follow? If you are, then you should know that once you're made well, your life will never be the same. Your home won't be the same. Your marriage won't be the same. Your priorities in life won't be the same. But I can tell you, there is no better place to be than at the feet of this Jesus who has come to heal his people. I pray that the Lord will persuade all of us to desire to get well and to be made ready by his grace for all of those implications that will follow. Look at the way the lame man answers him in verse 7. This is interesting here. The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. His answer there, it's not particularly an encouraging one, is it? In fact, it's really a complaint about how he believed he couldn't be healed due to a lack of help. 
In his answer, he shows that his focus, all of his focus on being cured has been placed for all these years upon something other than God. And Jesus is here asking him if he wishes to get well. And all he can think about are the ways he can get himself into this pool. He thinks that's the answer to all of his problems. If I could just get into this pool at the right time, then I know I could be made well. But Jesus asked him a really simple question, didn't he? Do you wish to get well? It's a simple yes or no answer at this point. Yet, he gives Jesus excuses and reasons as to why he can't be healed. In fact, he had more faith in that means than he had in the Lord. And on top of this, his attention was fixed on man, not God. He was looking for people to help. And this is a commentary on our society today, isn't it? People constantly think that in order to be healed of their greatest disease, speaking of sin and death, they have to do something. They have to turn to some means or some program or psychologist to some pill. They think their problems can all be solved by these man-made means. It's something that can be solved or resolved with means other than God. But friends, the fact of the matter is, it is Jesus alone who heals. It is Jesus alone who can make people well. There are no legitimate excuses for not coming to Christ to find that healing. Jesus asked, do you wish to get well? And friends, on judgment day, it will not do anyone any good to respond with, well, you know, Jesus, no one took me to you. Nobody took me to the pool. You don't need any help to come to him right now. He's inviting you and offering you healing. The question is the same question Jesus asked. Do you want it? Do you wish to be made well? Interestingly enough, Jesus doesn't enter into a discussion with the man about his excuses. Look at what Jesus tells him in verse 8 and on. Jesus says to him, Get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. And immediately the man became well and picked up his pallet and began to walk. What an example of God's unconditional mercy. There's no record at all of this man believing or having faith in Jesus. In fact, we learn in a few verses after this, he didn't even know who Jesus was. He didn't even know Jesus' name. Yet Jesus chose to heal him nevertheless. What kindness and compassion. Let's not miss the glory of Jesus in this miracle. Jesus commanded the man and immediately he was made well. This man did exactly what Jesus told him to do. This is nothing short, by the way, than the same power of God that we read about in the creation account. Just as when he said, let there be light, and there was light, so did he command this man, and the command was obeyed immediately. Wonderful, isn't it? There could be no doubt that Jesus is God. Absolutely no doubt. Let's continue on in the rest of verse 9 to to 16. Let's read a chunk here, and we'll kind of break this up afterwards. It says, Now was the Sabbath on that day. So the Jews were saying to the man who was cured, It is the Sabbath, and it is not permissible for you to carry your pallet. But he answered them, He who made me well was the one who said to me, Pick up your pallet and walk. They asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Pick up your pallet and walk? But the man who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had slipped away while there was a crowd in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. And for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. The end of verse 9 starts there with this. Now it was the Sabbath on that day. That was all that mattered to the Pharisees. This man had just been healed after being paralyzed for 38 years. Yet all the Pharisees could see is that this man was breaking the Sabbath. When they told him it was unlawful for him to carry his pallet on the Sabbath, he responded telling him that the person who made him well told him to take up his bed and walk. And you notice what they asked next? They didn't ask, who's the man that made you well? Rather, their question is, 
Who told you? Who's the man who told you to pick up your pallet and walk? They don't care about his healing. They wanted to know who gave you that bad advice to go ahead and break our man-made laws. That's exactly what they were. These were man-made rules. You see, the Pharisees were known for taking God's law and making a man-made fence to hedge it in, as if God's law needed to be protective or improved upon to make sure that God's people were in obedience. Consider these examples. In, In Exodus chapter 16, verse 29, it says this. It says, See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, he gives you bread for two days on the sixth day. Get this. Remain every man in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. What does that mean? Well, we may have one interpretation as God's people, but the scribes had their own interpretation of these laws. They, in light of this particular section of Scripture, came up with the concept of a Sabbath day's journey. By their own discretion, they determined it would equal 1,000 yards. According to their own understanding, a person could walk up to a thousand yards on the Sabbath day, but to go over that, they'd be in sin. And according to the law that they made, if the rope was tied to something across the street, then the whole street could technically be considered one house, and the person in question would then have the freedom to walk beyond that a thousand yards a day. Another example is if you spit on the ground on the Sabbath, you had to make sure your spit landed on a rock and didn't land on the dirt. Because if you spit on the dirt and somebody else stepped on it and formed a slight furrow on the ground, then you'd be guilty of plowing on the Sabbath. Another example is that you could dip a turnip in salt, but you had to be careful because if you dipped it too long, it could be considered pickling and a violation of working on the Sabbath. There there are many more things that could be brought up, but the thing we need to understand is neither Jesus nor this man had actually broken the Sabbath as it's taught in God's word. If Jesus had broken the Sabbath, then he would be guilty of sin and the scriptures would be in error all over the place because the scriptures teach us that Jesus committed no sin. Had he sinned here, he would have never been able to be our savior. In fact, in the passage that Brother Brad read in in Luke 13, Jesus uses the very law of God to refute these people. It was in accordance to God's law to be merciful to your animals on the Sabbath. So he said, how dare you question being merciful to people created in God's image on the Sabbath while you are being merciful to animals? This was not a violation of the Sabbath. It was what's entitled in the Sabbath. It's mercy. It's mercy. In this miracle, Jesus reminds us that he is over and above the rules of men. And that still applies to today. We are to obey God and God alone. When we are asked to do something that is contrary to God's word, we must obey Christ. You know, this problem of man trumping their laws over God's laws continues today. You see it in churches where we prescribe clothing at the door that we deem is more appropriate or where it's considered sinful to own a television or have a glass of wine. These are man-made rules in which men have come to believe that they are protecting God's law by fencing it in with their additions. It's ungodly. Jesus has one word to such people. You hypocrite. And that's the interesting thing about these kinds of people, by the way. The hypercritical tend to be the hypocritical. I don't know what makes that so, but it seems to be true. When the Pharisees questioned the man as to who told him to do what he was doing, he said, he who made me well said to me, take up your pallet and walk. By responding in this way, we get the sense that he may have been saying, listen, if this person has the power to heal me after 38 years of being sick, then he certainly has the power and right to tell me exactly what to do. And guess what, buddy? I'm certainly going to do what he says. No questions asked. Sorry if it doesn't jive with your rules. This man who has the power of sin and death and infirmities is the one who told me to pick up my pallet and walk. And this man decided to head over to the temple to probably pay his vows of thanksgiving for being healed here. And while at the temple, Jesus finds him and he says another really interesting phrase here. Behold, you have become well. Do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to you. 
Now, this comment from Jesus has led people to one of two different interpretations of this passage. Some people take this to mean that Jesus is telling him that the reason that he was sick in the first place was due to some sin on his part, and Jesus is telling him not to go back to his old ways, lest he end up in a worse situation than he was at first. Now, there's no doubt that some people experience temporal judgments in this life as a result of their sin. That does happen. For example, a person could be a drug addict and end up paralyzed as a result of getting behind the wheel and crashing. That's a cause and effect right there. Sin was at the forefront of this person's problem. Nevertheless, one thing we can be sure of is every affliction and trouble carries in it the voice of God calling people into repentance. Every affliction and trouble carries in it the voice of God calling people into repentance. Whatever troubles we face in this life, we do well to spend some time before the Lord in repentance for any sin we may discover. So it is always a good thing when we see these things going on around us to see where we are exactly with the Lord. Troubles are always a wake-up call to the fact that there is a day that is coming and fast approaching when all of us will be standing before the Lord. It's going to happen, and we need to be prepared for it. Even as every sickness and sorrow ought to lead us to repentance, so too every healing ought to lead us to praise and worship and to live our lives more carefully as we walk with the Lord. Too often, when God grants us relief from our troubles or our sickness— we forget the things we learned or the promises we made while we were in our sick beds. In those cases, we ought to say to ourselves, do not sin anymore so that nothing worse happens to me. All those things said, I do, however, believe that these words spoken to this man in this account were meant to be taken as a call to faith and repentance for the first time in his life. In other words, now that he's been healed, he ought to surrender himself to Jesus. Because if he doesn't know Jesus in a saving way, then the troubles he knew as a paralyzed man for 38 years will be nothing compared to the eternal suffering in the afterlife. This is a warning to all those people who are outside Christ today. Just because one has been healed physically does not mean that all is well spiritually. Many people have received mercy upon mercy from the Lord in this life, but they've never come to know the mercy of salvation. Jesus is telling this man and all people who have known his mercy that we must not be content with receiving just his temporal mercies. They are wonderful, and we ought to pray for those temporal mercies, but we should all press on to know how to receive his eternal mercy through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This story continues to a point where the man goes back to the Pharisees and he tells them about this one that made him well. Again, it's not clearly understood whether he was doing this out of spite or doing this out of bringing glory to Jesus. It's hard to know from this account. But regardless, once the Pharisees heard that Jesus was to blame, we're told they persecuted Christ and sought to kill him. In verses 17 and 18, Jesus responded with these words, but he answered them, my father is working until now and I myself am working. And for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. What an ugly picture of the sinful heart of man. Jesus was merciful to this man. And how did they respond? They sought to kill him. Did you notice Jesus wasn't even the one who actually broke the Pharisees' law? Jesus didn't pick up anything and carry it. He wasn't even guilty of breaking their law. They just didn't like his ministry. They didn't like the fact that he was pointing people to the word itself. The thing is, even if they weren't able to prosecute him as a violator of their Sabbath laws, they still had something else they were going to attack him on. He made himself equal with God. And that was blasphemy that was punishable by death. And Jesus basically told them, even though the Father created for six days and rested on the Sabbath, it doesn't mean that the Father takes time off in sustaining and preserving the world. Friends, God God is still at work today, governing all his creatures and their actions. 
He still sustains all things by the word of his power. And Jesus says, just as the Father continues to work, so do I, making himself equal with the Father. Again, they knew what he meant by that. So they sought all the more to kill him. They saw miracle after miracle, and all they could do was harden their hearts all the more to Jesus Christ. My prayer here this morning is simple. is that the Lord would soften all of our hearts, that we might truly see his glory as a son of God and praise him for calling us into relationship, healing us, and making us well in his atonement. So just one question I want to leave you with here this morning. Do you wish to get well? Maybe you've never responded to the gospel. Maybe you've been charged today to go and sin no more. Maybe today for the first time you've recognized that God has, has maybe healed you physically. He may have blessed you with some of his temporal mercies, but you've never experienced the eternal mercy of salvation because you've never given your life over to Christ, submitted to him, and called him your Lord and King. Do you wish to get well? Because, friends, you, you may be temporarily healthy in a physical way this morning. But let me promise you something. Can I promise you something? That won't last. There's one thing that's guaranteed for each one of us here today. And that is, we will pass away and we will face judgment. Do you wish to get well? But maybe you are a Christian here today and you've been struggling with a particular sin. And God's asking this today in your life more as a sanctification. Do you wish to get well? Or do you enjoy holding on to that bitterness that you had against somebody Or do you enjoy still too much of your own sinfulness to submit and repent of that sin? The question is simple. Do you wish to get well?